Hello and welcome to Mr. C History. Right, today we're on the hunt for Thomas Cromwell. He was the chief minister for Henry VIII, his Svengali, his Lord High, everyone else as it were. And we're going to go around London to see some of his sites of real power, to see how significant he was. Now he's got a bit of a bad reputation, old Thomas, because some people think of him as this true arch-villain of the Tudor period, murdering and all sorts of things. Others might view him as the hero of the Reformation, the man who broke power away from Rome, perhaps. So let's see what we can find out as we go along. But I'm starting here in Putney, specifically in Brewhouse Lane, or the Brewhouse Lane quarter, because in about the year 1485, Thomas Cromwell was born here. We say about because very little is actually known about his early life. But it is believed that that's around the time he was born. He was the only son of uh, Walter and uh, Elizabeth. And actually, if you read Hilary Mantel's War Fall, which some of you may have done, Walter, his father, is painted in quite a bad light as a very violent man. There's not actually much evidence to back this up. It is true, though, that Walter was in trouble quite a bit with the law. Why? Well, because, amongst other things, he owned a pub and he was accused of, quite regularly, of watering down the beer, which I agree is a heinous crime, but whether that deserves the reputation, I don't know. By his own description, Thomas Cromwell described himself as a bit of a ruffian in his youth. And so, by the age of 18, he decides to go off to the continent to become a French mercenary. And then things really do go a bit murky and a bit... We don't really know what happens down in Europe, but it is true he spent some time in Italy. Indeed, he might have spent time in the court of Machiavelli, which would explain his leadership style quite a lot there. He also spent some time in the Low Countries, sort of Netherlands, etc., which at the time was a real bastion of Protestantism, the Reformation again. And that's going to come in very apparent if you look at some of his religious forms. So it's true that Thomas Cromwell was quite well versed in the, what was going on in Europe at the time and was keen to bring that back to Britain. But first and foremost, his time in Europe, he had developed lots of contacts and had become a great merchant. And so that's why we're now going to head to the City of London to explain that a bit. This is the famous Holbein portrait of Thomas Cromwell, which you can see in the National Portrait Gallery. He looks very powerful in his um, archetypal hat and his furs. And the book on the table, the Book of Hours, has just been discovered, a Hever Castle. This is Austin Friars, which is in the heart of the city of London. And indeed, in the 1520s, this was also the heart of the city of London. And someone like Thomas Cromwell would have found this a very good base to be a merchant, to sell his goods, to make sure he was using those contacts he had made in Europe very well. Now, he returned back to London about 1515, uh, and he married Elizabeth as well around that time. And they had three children. Gregory, Anne and Grace, and all was going very well. And they had a very grand house here and one in Stepney, which we'll go have a look at later. And the modern day Draper's Hall, which is just behind me, this is obviously the modern building. And there's a slightly grander version just uh, to the front as well. It's about the location of this house. And some maps even have it, and they even have it uh, named as Thomas Cromwell's house. So it was a huge grand. He made so much money and developed that power and power. But unfortunately, 1529 tragedy struck uh, Thomas because both his wife and his two daughters died. They died of a sweating sickness, um, and probably all caught together, and they died within a few weeks of, of each other. So it really was a, a really tragic event. Now, some historians have tried to sort of put this point, you know, that motivated him. It sort of, that was right at the beginning of his rise to power, 1530 onwards, when he uh, gets in and obviously 1534 to 36, all that, you know, real powerful stuff after his wife had died. Was he lonely? Was he motivated by this? We, we obviously don't know, but he's a man who was, um, had, had, had quite a blow of tragedy in his time. This is a lovely Victorian pump and come lamppost sort of thing, but actually, most importantly, just behind me here, these buildings, is Gray's Inn, the court, place where you learn to become a lawyer. And indeed, in the 1520s, this is where Thomas Cromwell learned to become a lawyer. And it was as a lawyer that he went into the service of Cardinal Wolsey. Now, he was here during the time after he came back from Europe and he was making all that money in the city. He was also becoming a lawyer. Now he enters into the service of Cardinal Wolsey. Who was Cardinal Wolsey? Well, he was King Henry VIII's right-hand man. Thomas Cromwell becomes his right-hand man. So very, very, very closely, uh, getting closer and closer to the king. Also under the service of Wolsey, Cromwell becomes an MP and will start to become an influential figure in Parliament. Come 1530, the king's great matter, Cardinal Wolsey is unable to deal with it, in steps Thomas Cromwell. Let's now go to the Palace of Whitehall to find out how.
This is the Ministry of Defence, and actually this is what's known as Queen Mary Stairs. Now, these were actually built in 1691, so not much of a reflection, but this is where the original Whitehall Palace would have been, one of the main palaces of Henry VIII. He would have been around Greenwich and Hampton Court and Whitehall, and indeed Thomas Cromwell would have come and worked for Henry VIII in either one of those places. This was the most convenient for me. Unfortunately, there's not much less for the Tudors. I think in the basement, apparently, is the wine cellars, which is still Tudor, but I'm sure Thomas Cromwell went to the wine cellars. Anyway, what, as I was saying, what was the king's great matter? Well, Henry VIII's great matter was the fact that he wanted to, to divorce his wife, Catherine of Aragon. He'd been married for 24 years to Catherine, but unfortunately, she had not borne him his coveted son. So he was getting a bit frustrated with this. He believed he was being punished by God because obviously Catherine of Aragon had been betrothed to his brother before, his brother Arthur before Arthur had died. So Henry thought he was being punished. He asked Cardinal Wolsey to deal with it so he could get a divorce. But he couldn't get a divorce because only the Pope could grant a divorce and the Pope was saying no. And Cardinal Wolsey kept hitting a brick wall and eventually this led to Cardinal Wolsey's downfall. In comes Thomas Cromwell. Now interestingly, Thomas Cromwell actually stayed loyal to, to Wolsey, yeah, making speeches in Parliament and actually begging mercy to the King. It didn't work, Henry VIII still murdered Wolsey, but actually Henry was quite impressed with Cromwell's loyalty and brought him along and indeed Cromwell put this characteristic loyalty to Henry as well. Uh, and the way it manifested itself was he said, I'll sort out this great matter for you, sir. And indeed in Parliament, now as, as I say, he was an MP, he made various different speeches, pushing through various different reforms. And eventually that led, in 1534, to the Act of Supremacy, which meant that King Henry VIII was the head of the Church of England, not the Pope. Therefore, who can grant divorces? The head of the English Church. Henry VIII could grant himself a divorce. Fantastic move away Catherine Aragon. It also helps that he's got, Henry VIII has got a fancy woman on the, uh, in the form of Anne Boleyn who he wants to marry as well. So with the act of supremacy passed, Henry married to Anne Boleyn. Things are looking good for Thomas Cromwell and indeed Henry puts a lot of faith in him and gives him so many positions. He's master of the rolls, master of the jewels, he looks after the crown jewels which is a position of great power and indeed by about 1536 with the dissolution of the monasteries he's at his all-time most powerful position. This is St Dunstan's Church in Stepney. Now in the 1520s and 1530s, Stepney was a lovely suburb, a bit more than that actually, it was the countryside. And here is where Thomas Cromwell had his lovely country estate. And it was called the rather appropriate and interesting name, Great Place, quite an original name there. And indeed he would come here during the plagues and he would obviously send his children and his wife here. And indeed his wife, as we just discussed, died here uh, as well. And so, and if you actually, if you go around there, there's some actually Tudor windows, and this church was around then. The palace, unfortunately, is no more, but so some, you get a real, maybe tangible link to Thomas Cromwell here. But as this is a religious building, I thought it'd be a good idea to discuss the dissolution of the monasteries. This is part of Thomas Cromwell's religious reforms, something he's very, very, very famous for, and such a seismic revolutionary, as some historians have described it. Uh, procedure or policy that he pursued. So what was it all about? We've already discussed the act of supremacy. To get the divorce from Catherine Aragon, he had to be declared head of the church. Now, to galvanise that, to really confirm that, he has to push away any other support of the Pope. He, Henry VIII is worried that if people still support the Pope, they won't be loyal to him. So he needs to, he goes and asks his key, uh, Svengali, his key administrator, Thomas Cromwell, to go and sort that out for him. Go and get the people, the church, on his side. Now, Thomas Cromwell sends off a royal commission to all the monasteries around England. Where the monasteries monks and the, ab uh, the abbeys, etc. They're extremely powerful. And along with power, they have money and land. Henry wants to get his hands on that, not only to crush them, but also to get all the money so he can fight loads of wars. So Cromwell passes two very significant acts in 1536 and 1539, the Acts of Suppression. This takes all the money from the monasteries, it closes them down, gives them, but gives the land and the money from those monasteries to Henry VIII. He is all powerful now. A key aspect that comes from this as well is obviously people are quite, uh, the people of Britain are quite angry at the change to their church and it leads to rebellions. Indeed, one of the biggest rebellions of the Tudor period, the Pilgrimage of Grace, takes place in 1536 and some historians feel that this is the biggest threat to, to the Tudor dynasty. I'm not totally sure about that, but that's a different uh, case in point. What does Cromwell do? He crushes it. He brutally oppresses anyone who opposes it. He 
purges the Conservative wing of the Privy Council and Parliament to get this push through. Henry VIII is going to be firmly the king and it's Cromwell who pushes this forward. He's going to be his great favourite again. This, of course, is the Tower of London and what better place to talk about Anne Boleyn and Thomas Cromwell's role in her downfall. Well, by 1536, Henry has grown tired of Anne Boleyn. Why? Well, she hasn't produced a son. She just produced Princess Elizabeth, who obviously will later become Queen Elizabeth I. He's also taken an interest in Jane Seymour, another woman who, of course, he's buried next to, so he's very, very keen on her. She's fallen out of favour with several people in the court for various different reasons, and she's also had arguments with Thomas Cromwell as well over money, over where the money for the, from the dissolution of monasteries will come through. So it's not, she's not managing her relationships very well. Uh, anyway, so Thomas Cromwell, feel, he's starting to become at the height of his power, 1536 as well. And so he starts to spread rumours. Are these rumours true? You can decide on what you want with this, or are they not? But whatever the case, they go around court and they get eventually to Henry VIII. What are the rumours? That uh, Anne Boleyn is having an affair or uh, committing adultery against Henry. And so it is, it, it steamrolls, etc. Henry's looking to marry Jane Seymour. Thomas Cromwell wants ultimate power. And so she's taken here to the Tower of London and she is executed. Indeed, she's buried there in the church. And you can actually see her grave uh, uh, in St. Peter ad vincula, Peter in chains there. So Thomas Cromwell, not maybe his finest hour in the downfall of this uh, rather heroic queen, I think. Back at Whitehall to describe the downfall of Thomas Cromwell. Well, it's often noted it's all about Anne of Cleves, and that's certainly true. Uh, by 1540, and, uh, Jane Seymour has died. Henry's looking for a new wife, and Thomas Cromwell, he was sort of, he's been waning a little bit in uh, Henry's favour, thinks, I've got to weigh in, I'll get him another wife. And so he commissions a portrait painted of Anne of Cleves by Holbein, the same person who uh, inspired the painting that we saw of Thomas Cromwell in the National Portrait Gallery. He gets Holbein to paint a picture, rather flattering, Henry sees this portrait and says, oh yes, I'll have some of that. Hen uh, Anne of Cleves comes, meets Henry VIII, and Henry VIII is very disappointed. I like her not, he says, and pushes all her away if the marriage is annulled. This is bad for Cromwell. He's lost the support of Henry. Couple this with the fact that Thomas has made lots of enemies in the Privy Council, notably the Duke of Norfolk, uh, who, has, who didn't like Cromwell because of his lowly status. And the Duke of Norfolk and other members of the Privy Council start whispering in the King's ear, saying, you know, Thomas Cromwell, he's plotting against you, etc., etc., etc. And indeed, many of the rebels in the Pilgrim of Grace had blamed Thomas Cromwell, not the King. So Henry is probably thinking, I'm not sure about this guy. And sure enough, Henry arrests him and he gets sent to the Tower of London. Now, after he was arrested, he was brought to the Tower of London. And initially, Henry VIII toyed with him a bit, actually. And... Uh, let him sort of stew in the cell for a few days uh, and he, he sent messages Thomas Cromwell sent messages to Henry saying pleading mercy 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 always showing how loyal he was but to no avail on the 28th of July 1540 Thomas Cromwell was brought here to the scaffold on Tower Hill where the famous martyrs are commemorated today and he was beheaded interestingly it was the same day that Henry VIII married Catherine Howard the niece of the Duke of Norfolk, the sort of almost perceived leader of this conservative faction in the Privy Council, which saw the downfall of Thomas Cromwell. There's some apocryphal idea that um, Cromwell, that the executioner took lots of blows to his head. I, the, there's lots of different varying accounts on that. But here died Thomas Cromwell, beheaded. It's finally that the powerful arch, you know, villain of the Tudor period was downfall was here. Well, perhaps this is a good place to end then. What's his uh, legacy? Well, I mean, to be honest with you, Cromwell wasn't really thought of much at all until, until the 1950s, until the great Tudor historian Elton, G.R. Elton, sort of highlighted he is very important and he called him revolutionary. I mean, that might be taking a step too far, but many people didn't actually consider it more before. But he, this is a man who changed Britain from being a Catholic nation to a Protestant one. Yes, you can look at maybe it was Henry VIII, but I think Henry VIII was too busy worrying about his wives. It was, I do believe that Cromwell was motivated by a slight religious fervour that he learned about his time in Europe. And he really did push it through. He was ruthless, but he got things done. Did he do it in a villainous way? Where, you know, his dealings with Henry, with Anne Boleyn, of course, not great. But those of you who are, you know, predisposed to Protestantism, do you think he's a hero? Tell me what you think. Um, anyway, I hope you enjoyed that as always. Please don't forget to subscribe. Lots of other Tudor videos around and I'll see you on the next one.